test to be felt, but they shouldn't dominate our lives. If they do, they become harmful. Anxiety, fear, complaining, deception. Do you feel like you are drowning in your emotions? Are they intoxicating you and your surroundings? You can seem to be at peace. It's time to be free. Toxic emotions. It's Saturday evening. Welcome wherever you're joining us from, whether you're in your car, at the park, you're having a cookout, you're at home in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever you're at, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We are on part three of our current series, Toxic Emotions. And today we are talking about fear and how to approach fear and how to deal with fear. Uh, so to today, I, I, I'm really excited to share part three. But before we dive into today's message, I want to take a moment to express a few words uh, for current events. Over the last several days, we've been watching on, on the news everything that's been going on, not only in our community, not, not only in our city, but in our nation. And I want to encourage you to stand with our black brothers and sisters. You know, if you are Hispanic, if, if you're also a minority. And I myself have dealt with, I've been a victim of racism. You know, I've dealt with it while living here in the U.S. You know, I'm actually from the U.S., but I myself have dealt with racism. But one thing I do know is that I haven't dealt with racism to the extent of my black brothers and, uh, black, uh, brothers and sisters, by no means. But I want to take this moment to encourage you to, um, to, to engage. I want to I I take this moment to, for us to empathize if we haven't done so with our black brothers and sisters. I want to take this moment to encourage you to educate yourself. Perhaps you have zero idea what's going on or, or you have no absolutely no idea of what's going on in our world, but I encourage you to educate on behalf of what's going on. And lastly, to express. I want you to be a voice to the voiceless. And I want you to be able to have this conversation at home when you're having dinner, when you're with your kids, when you're with your wife, when, whomever you're with, with your grandpa, with your grandma, whomever you're with at home, I want you to take a moment to have a conversation. It could be very uncomfortable having this conversation because I know that there's a lot of Hispanics and a lot of brown people out there that uh, don't want to really conversate about the suffering and the systemic racism that's going on. They, they, they just rather be content and they're comfortable with their state. But I'm here to encourage you to, to don't hold back. Don't stand still. But I encourage you to get involved one way or another. You may not be able to go to a protest, but you can get involved in social media. You can get involved by donate, donating online to different organizations that are supporting uh, justice at the moment. And join this revolution. I mean, 2020 couldn't get any more crazy, right? But I think this is a perfect opportunity for the church to stand. I think this is a perfect opportunity for you that are watching to stand and, and say, we, we do not tolerate racism. God doesn't tolerate race, racism, so we're not going to tolerate racism. So I want to encourage you to be a voice. I want to encourage you to advocate for to end systemic racism. Together, we'll be able to do this. So stand with me. I stand with all my black brothers and sisters. So let's do this together. Talk about it at home. Talk about it with your coworkers. Don't stay silent. Now's the time to end systemic racism and hatred in our world. And, and we're going to dive into the message, but I just want to take this moment to express those words. I wanted to take this moment to express those words. But today, I'm, I'm very excited because we are in part three. Part three of our current series, Toxic Emotions. And we've been talking about what it is to experience anxiety. We've been talking about what it is to have, you know, complaining in our lives. And last week we talked about, you know, dissatisfactions in our lives. We talked about how complaining leads to dissatisfaction and so on and so on. But I want to encourage for you to, to create a conversation at home. You know, whether you're watching, whether you have family members or friends that are watching the Spanish one, or you're just strictly watching the English one, um, create a conversation at home about toxic emotions. I truly 
think that God is doing something extraordinary in our hearts and our minds so that we can get past this together so that we may be able to grow in these areas. So today is fear. And I have titled this message, Why Are You So Afraid? Why Are You So Afraid? So take a moment and I want you to ask your neighbor, the person next to you, whoever's sitting next to you, whoever is in the car with you, maybe you got somebody riding shotgun with you or maybe you're having a cookout. I'm talking to you. Take a moment and ask your neighbor, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And we're going to go to the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35 through 41, where we see where Jesus here calms the storm. And uh, there's two questions that Jesus asks that I I, I do believe have a profound meaning that correlate with fear and disbelief in our lives. Verse 35 says, On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd, the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with them. Other boats were there too. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. There was other boats that were there too. I'm wondering why that was included in there. Suddenly, a strong wind blew up and the waves began to spill over into the boat so that it was about to fill with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat sleeping with his head on the pillow, the disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Don't you care that we're about to die? So Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping, his head on a pillow, and all of a sudden, we have waves, and we have a storm surge, we have high winds, and the disciples are freaking out. And they go, and they say, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? There's another version that says, don't you care that we're about to drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the two questions that pop to me are when Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And I think that's interesting how Jesus asked them those two questions, because one deals with fear and the other deals with faith. And I believe that Jesus was taking this moment to, as a teaching lesson for his disciples They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? So they were no longer terrified of, you know, what was going on around them, but they were terrified at the very individual that was standing before them. This respect, this awe, this fear for God fell upon them. It hit them hard. It woke them up. They said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Do we live by fear or do we live by faith? So take a moment, ask the person that's in your household, in your car, at the park, you're having a cookout, do we live by fear or do we live by faith? Think about it for a moment. Do you live by fear or do you live by faith? And I like to think that when the disciples were freaky now because of the storm surge, the wind and the waves and the water coming into the boat, I, I want to I say that the disciples you know, reacted and they, they were scared. But I also want to say that the disciples' survival mechanism kicked in gear. The disciples' survival mechanism kicked into gear. And it is true. Fear is a survival mechanism that kicks into gear when the brain senses danger. And I want to say that the disciples, during this boat ride, with high winds and water getting into the boat, I, I want to say that they sense the danger upon them. I mean, for crying out loud, they asked Jesus, they asked teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Don't you care that we're about to drown? And I want to say that that 
indicated that the disciples were scared. The disciples probably didn't know how to swim. I mean, they probably didn't have any swimming lessons like we do nowadays where you take your baby, your toddler, and you take them out to swimming lessons. I mean, I want to say that the disciples were facing serious danger. And, you know, the fact that they went to Jesus tells us that they had a little bit of faith in him. They had somewhat of, 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 of a belief in God that maybe Jesus could get them out of the storm. I mean, for crying out loud, they, they had never seen a miracle like this that put them in awe and wonder and with such deep respect for Jesus afterwards. Afterwards. There's different aspects of fear. There's the aspect, there's a physical aspect, there's a mental aspect, there's the emotional aspect, and there's also the spiritual aspect. Jesus wanted to use this moment to test the faith of his disciples. Jesus wanted to use this moment to test the faith of his disciples, to test their belief, their belief system. We have a belief system. And I believe Jesus wanted to use this very moment to teach the disciples about faith, to teach the disciples about their belief system. And it says that, you know, Jesus told them, hey, let's go to the other side of the lake. You know, let's let's go. But Jesus, the scripture says that Jesus was already in the boat. And the disciples just joined them and they, they pulled over to the other side of the lake. But it also indicates, the scripture also indicates that there was other boats there too. And I want to assume that there was probably other boats that Jesus could have jumped into, but he decided to jump into this particular boat. Why? I don't know. Go figure. But I I believe that Jesus, you know, chose this boat for a reason. He sensed a disbelief in their lives. And how many times has God or other people around us that truly care about us sense a disbelief in our lives, in our walk with God? That too often we find ourselves afraid of the outcome. We find ourselves fearing for our lives. It could be that we are in a chaotic season with our lives. And just as Jesus used the wind and the waves and the water getting into the boat, the storm, to test their faith, to test their belief, I believe that God also in the midst of our own storms, in the midst of our own chaotic lives and seasons, God is also present there. But I believe that those only are only there to really test the genuine faith inside of us that either cause us to fear and be afraid of the outcome in the future, or we choose to believe in God and trust God. It could be that maybe you're in a chaotic season with your family, It could be that maybe you're in a chaotic season with your spouse, with your wife, with your husband, or with your baby mama, your baby daddy. It could be that you're in a chaotic season with your business because of the pandemic and then now violent riots. Or maybe you're in a chaotic season because of your health. But I believe that God uses these areas in our lives here on earth to truly see if we trust them, to see where our belief system's at. But many times we don't. Many times we don't, and you are afraid of the outcome. You're terrified of the future. Man, I don't know how my health is going to turn out after this. Man, these kids just, I've had it with these kids. Like, they're going to be worse worse off than than me. Man, I'm tired of this baby mama. Man, like she just keeps like just nagging and nagging and nagging and nagging or your spouse or family members. And it could be that your future isn't looking so bright. It could be that you're afraid of the outcome. It could be that you're afraid of what's on the other side. It could be that you're terrified of the future. Fear is the worst possible projection of the future. I mentioned this two weeks ago, that fear is the worst possible projection of the future. Faith is the most beautiful projection of the future. My question to you is, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose this evening? Are you going to choose to be afraid? 
Are you going to choose to live in fear? Or are you going to choose to live by faith, trusting in the one who knows it all? Fear is the worst possible projection of the future. And one of the reasons why we live in fear is because we don't fully trust God. I'll say it again. One of the reasons why we live terrified and frightening, one of the reasons why we live in fear is because we, we don't fully trust God. You trust God in certain areas of your life, but you don't trust God with the outcome of going to a concert going to a therapist, talking to your spouse, confronting those issues, confronting those battles. And I think that one of the reasons why our belief system diminishes because we choose to trust in other things. We don't trust that God can heal the past and the present. And when we don't fully trust God, we tend to not trust God with the healing process of what happened in the past or what's going on in the present. And if we don't trust God to heal our past and our present or to, so that God can deal with our past and our present, how are we going to trust God to lead us into a new future? How are we going to trust God to lead us into a new future? We say we believe in God, but do you trust him? Our actions determine whether we do or not. Our actions determine whether we do or not. The disciples had a disbelief that caused them to be so afraid. The disciples in this situation, in this problem, where they, find them, where they found themselves in the boat, they had a disbelief that caused them to be so afraid. And they responded, Jesus responded with two questions. Why, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? These are the two questions that Jesus asked back to back to his disciples. But I want to say that the disciples believed in God a little bit. You know, they trusted God a little bit. You know, they had a little bit of faith in God, you know, when it was convenient. And many times when life gets chaotic, when there's all sorts of problems arising in our personal lives, in our minds, and in our hearts, and in our family, in our jobs, in our businesses, we tend to believe in God just a little more than usual. And the disciples found themselves asking, Teacher, don't you care? We're about to drown. We're about to die. And I want to say that they had a little bit of hope in Jesus Christ, but they, they, they didn't really fully trust him. And how many times does that happen with our own lives? Well, when life gets a little hard, you tend to rely on your, your faith, the little faith you have, the little belief in God, or you only run to God when there's issues. Or your last option is God. And the disciples found themselves asking, don't you care? We're about to drown. And it could very well be that you're drowning right now in fear. It could very well be that you're drowning right now in anxiety, in worries. It could very well be that the issues of life are drowning you. And you feel as if you're about to die. You feel as if everything is just going downhill. And the disciples asked Jesus, Teacher, don't you care? We're about to die. We're about to drown. This indicated that they had faith in him. But the faith, that the faith that they had was a response to the issues that were going on. And if you find yourself in a chaotic season in your life, I want to invite you to trust him. I want to encourage you to trust him. Because I feel right now there's somebody watching that is facing a specific issue in their life an issue nobody knows about, an issue that maybe one other individual knows about, and you're afraid of the outcome. You're terrified of the future. But Jesus is reminding us that even in the midst of a chaotic season in our lives, he is right there. He is in the, he is in the midst of our problems. He is in the midst of our storm. It could be that our disbelief is causing us to fear. 
and to live in fear. Because, number one, the past haunts us. The, the, the past is haunting you. And it could very well be that your disbelief in the moment is causing you not only to fear, but to live in fear to the point where the past is haunting you. The past is haunting you. What's happened in the past is haunting you. You say, I failed as a husband. I failed as a wife, as a dad, as a mom. Why should I try again? Or I failed in my business. Why should I try again? I failed in that relationship. I failed in the friendships. You know, I tried that. Why should I try it again? But I believe that reasons, the reasons why we don't try it again is because we're afraid of the outcome. We're afraid of the future. We're terrified of what could happen. But I want to remind you this evening to trade fear for faith. But not just any faith, but trade fear for faith in our God, in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of our soul. Some of us won't even bother going out for coffee with somebody that keeps inviting us because we think that that individual is going to turn out like the other individual. You keep turning down dates or you don't even want to try anymore because of previous relationships, because of previous disappointments. Or there could be somebody that's just wondering, will I ever get married? Will I ever have a family? Will I ever re get my, my joy back? Will I ever experience the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace? And I think the reason why we sometimes ask ourselves that question is because the past is haunting you. And if you're dragging your past with you into your present, you can forget about seeing a future. You can forget about seeing a future. I love the scripture in Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 that says, but forget all that. Forget the former things. It is nothing compared to what I'm about to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness and will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And I love the scripture in Isaiah because it's reminding us that, hey, forget about the former things. But the reason why we're not able to see the new things God is doing is because the past is just holding us down. The past is haunting us. And the reason why we can't believe in God is because we keep fearing the outcome. We keep fearing the truth. But I'm reminding you this evening to trade fear for faith that God is doing something new. And the reason why we're not able to see the new things God is doing right now is because we're still thinking of the past. We're still thinking of the past. And the psalmist said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. The psalmist said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Being fearful, have a connection, have an opposite connection with trusting. And one of, the, one of the reasons why our disbelief is causing us to live in fear, number two, is because some of us believe in God, but don't know him. Some of us believe in God, but don't know him. Man, I, I, don't, I don't know if I do this, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, if I choose to go out with this, this girl, if I choose to go out with this dude, if I, if I choose to go to this school, if I choose to, I, I don't know, you know, if I choose to do this or that, you know, man, what is the will of God for my life? I think a lot of people, a lot of young people are asking themselves that question. What is the will of God for my life? What is the purpose here on earth? And number two, some, some of us believe in God but don't know him. One of the easiest ways to get to, know, to get to know God is to trust him at his word. Trust him at his word. Don't trust what your friend is telling you, what the things that you only want to hear, not what you need to hear. Don't trust maybe your dad or your mom who's just bashing you or don't trust that other individual. Don't trust mere mortal words. But I want you to trust God at his word. And I think when we choose to believe God at his word, we begin to know the will 
for our lives. We begin to know the purpose for our lives. And we can drive fear out to begin to have that faith in God. And number three, it could be that our disbelief is causing us to fear and live in fear because we don't fully trust God. We partially surrender to God. And I want to say that when the disciples said, teacher, don't you see that we're about to drown? Don't you see that we're about to die? I want to say that the disciples had, had some type of trust in God, but they didn't trust him completely. And I think many times why we're afraid of the future, we're afraid of the outcome, we live in fears because we partially surrender our lives to God. But I want to invite you this evening to surrender your whole life to God. I'm inviting you this evening to surrender your whole life to God. The reason why some of us keep running and running and running in circles in fear is because we partially surrender to God. Some of us believe in God, but don't know him very well. Some of us believe in God, but don't know him very well. Tell the person next to you, trade fear for faith. The person next to you in the kitchen, in the dining room, in the living room, the cookout, at the park, wherever you're at right now, tell the, next per the person next to you, trade fear for faith. Trade fear for faith in him, in him. And I believe that when you trade fear for faith, things in your life will begin to dramatically change. You will have a new perspective. You will have new revelation. And I believe that God will begin to do things in your life that you've never experienced before. But don't just sit there in faith. I want to invite you to put your faith to work. James 2.20 says that faith without works is useless. You see that faith was active long ago with his works, talking about Abraham, and faith was completed by his works. Now you can say, I trust God, I have faith in God, but now do something about it. Do something about it. Don't just stand still. I'm inviting you to do something about it. Maybe change the friends you have. Stop going to that place. Stop going to that website. Stop going to that Instagram page. You say you believe in God and you say you have faith in God. But now it's time to do works. It's now it's time for us to do our part. Because faith without works is useless. And works without faith in God is also useless. And Jesus asked his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples had disbelief. And I want to invite you this evening. I want to invite you tonight to trust God. Trust God in the process. I want to invite you tonight to trust God with what he's doing right now in your life. That if you're terrified of the outcome, you're terrified of the future, I want you to trade it for having faith in the one who knows it all. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9 says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. You love him. You trust him. You believe in God. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Now I'm inviting you this evening, this night, to trust him. Trust him. Trust, trust him with your soul. Trust him with your, with your anxious heart, with your anxious mind. If you're terrified and you're running and running and running, and you're afraid of the outcome, I want you to trade it for faith. And I want to pray for you right now. So wherever you're at, just take a moment. Just close your eyes so that you don't get distracted. I want to pray for you. So just where you're at, Heavenly Father, I realize that there's a lot of fears in my life. There's a lot of insecurities in my life. I realize that sometimes I panic with the outcome of the future. I panic terrified 
or what the future holds. But today I am trading that for faith in you, Jesus Christ. And I, I'm, I'm accepting you as Lord and Savior of my soul. That just as gold purifies, just, just as, as, as gold is purified in fire, through these trials in our life here on earth, our faith is being tested to prove how genuine it is, God. And I pray that conviction may fall upon our hearts and our minds tonight. Jesus, help somebody right now that is struggling with fear. Somebody who is just terrified of what can happen. I choose to believe you tonight. I choose to believe you this evening, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, so much. Amen. Wasn't that a powerful word for today? I want to challenge you right now or after this service if you can just go ahead and take a selfie and put hashtag fearless with everyone who's joining you today. Once you're finished with that, we want to just remind you, thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first time joining us, please, please, please fill out the link down below. It's just a little bit of questions and we just want to get to know you a little bit more. Thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week at 7 p.m.